I'm reading from Acts chapter 8, and it can be found on page 1101 of the Church Bible. I'm reading about Philip and the Ethiopian from verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch didn't see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. going to have uh, Peter speak to us, um, but before we do that, can we just um, stretch our hands to him and pray that the Lord will speak through him. Father, we thank you for your servant here this morning. Holy Spirit, speak through him and give us your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As mentioned, uh, my name is Peter. Um, uh, as you will notice, I'm not originally from Luden. This isn't a Lutonian accent. Um, so if you get a bit confused with my northern slang, please do tell me to slow down. I will try my best to be clear. Uh, as mentioned, uh, me and my wife, uh, sat on the far end there, uh, we attend Stopsley Baptist Church. Uh, we've lived in Luden for around about 18 months now, uh, and Nick's, our friend, has popped down to see us from the place that we used to live up in the northwest, up near Manchester, uh, a place called St. Helens. So we, uh, we were up there previously. Um, I now work for an organization called Urban Saints. Uh, Urban Saints used to be called the Crusaders Union, uh, and we're based in Luden, and we do youth evangelism and youth discipleship. Uh, and I have the great role of being uh, an international director for Urban Saints, which means I get to travel the world, uh, unfortunately leaving my, my wife behind on many occasions uh, as I go. And uh, my role is to facilitate uh, youth groups to go and explore the world, understand a bit more about justice uh, and uh, God's role in, uh, in, in finding justice through adventurous ways. Um, it is a great privilege to be with you today. 
um, I always find it a privilege to come and share with what can be very intimate moments when you come and share and worship with a church. Uh, and, uh, and just to be able to come alongside. Uh, and uh, it is a great privilege to share God's word. Um, and as I've been praying, uh, I feel I've got the right word from the Lord. I hope I've got the right word from the Lord uh, for you today. Um, but uh, as was prayed this morning, uh, this has much been about a journey of learning for me. As I've, as I've studied God's word this week, God's been speaking to me through this passage. Um, and I want to just share some things that God has been sharing with me. And so... Uh, we pick up in uh, chapter, nine, uh, chapter 8 of uh, Acts, and uh, we come across a guy called Philip. Uh, and Philip isn't a very well-known guy uh, in the biblical text. He appears at this point, uh, chapter, chapter 8. He appears a little bit earlier in uh, chapter 6. Uh, you may remember the, uh, the appointment of the deacons. Uh, and the main one that we know about is a guy called Stephen, who was later stoned. Um, but this guy, Philip, was one of those original seven. He was picked from amongst uh, the believers of the church at that point in order to help uh, with the, the ministry to the widows. Uh, when the early church rose up, it had a lot, of, uh, a lot of widows, a lot of orphans who were attracted and who gathered. And uh, there was a bit of controversy. Uh, because actually some of the widows felt like they were being left out uh, in getting their portion. And so the apostles said, let's appoint seven people. This is getting too much for us to handle and to do the ministry of preaching and teaching and hearing from God. So they appointed seven men in order to look after this particular ministry. Very much like appointing a food bank coordinator, basically. Uh, and so, so Philip was one of the very first food bank coordinators that we read about in, uh, in the gospel texts. Uh, and so, so we got here, Philip. And then what happens is that the church gets very comfortable. Uh, by Acts 8, we're, we're around about four years after Jesus died and rose up uh, and was ascended into heaven. Four years, and the church kind of got very insular. It got very comfortable with who they were. They were just plodding on. They were doing what they were doing. And they'd forgotten the word that God had shared with them, which was, go out and make disciples, not only in Jerusalem, but go out to Jab Judea, go out to Samaria, and then go on to the ends of the earth. And four years later, this, this amazing thing had happened, and they saw Jesus rise from the dead. They'd received this word from God to go, and they got kind of stuck in Jerusalem. They'd spent a lot of time building up the church in Jerusalem, setting their foundations, and the church was good. It was a big church. I mean, many of us might remember uh, Peter's sermon, a sermon that anybody who preaches would dare, who would be proud to preach, because 3,000 people come to faith through one sermon. I have yet to have a sermon that has that level of impact, and I highly doubt I ever will do. Only the likes of Billy Graham could dare to have such a powerful sermon that would convert 3,000 people in just one day. But the church had kind of got stuck. It was meeting together. It was doing all the things that they should do, but they'd forgotten that actually God called them to the ends of the earth. And so the Bible text tells us that God raised up persecution against the church. What? How crazy is that, that we read of a God of love who actually raises up persecution in order to get the church out of their seats and moving? I don't think it was something that God loved to do. I don't think it was something that he really wanted to do. But actually, the church had become too comfortable. Is that like us in the UK? Have we become too comfortable? Are we happy just sitting in our happy little clubs, sharing with each other and not really stretching out? I can't talk for you, but I know that sometimes that is me. That sometimes I get stuck. Sometimes I'm happy just going to church, meeting with the people that I'm meeting. I do a job which means that I meet with a lot of churches. 
You know, it's a, it's a job which means that actually my interaction with non-Christians is very limited because my job means that I go from church to church to church to church to church to say, how can I improve your youth work? How can I help you grow and challenge and, and move out? But I don't ever really get that challenge and that opportunity to do that myself. Or at least that's what I tell myself, that I don't get those opportunities. I've become very comfortable with who I am. And so God raised up persecution against the church. And I would say that something is true today. If you look at the churches that are fastest growing, they're in places where actually the persecution is the hardest. India has just been bumped up to the top 10 in terms of persecuted churches in the world, according to Open Doors. And actually, they're one of the fastest growing churches in a country where it is illegal to share the gospel. And in a country where it's legal to share the gospel, we are dying, we're rescinding, we're closing the doors, we're locking people out, and we're hiding away. And God raised up persecution against the early church in order to get them out. And I feel something like that is happening again. It's getting harder to share the good news in schools. It's getting harder to share the good news in the street because actually people are raising up things like uh, prejudice. How dare you judge me? I'm doing my best. I'm a good person. I don't think we've really reached the point of persecution, friends, in this church, in this country. But it's coming. But that's because we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing in getting outside of the doors. We're happy just sitting here. And so God raised up persecution and he moved. And we read that actually the church was sent out and people were scattered. And Philip was one of the examples of the early Christians who was pushed out of Jerusalem. And it says that he went to Samaria. And he met with a guy called Simon who was a sorcerer. And there's a great story about how this sorcerer comes to faith and receives the Holy Spirit. And then what we read is we read that Simon, uh, we read that Philip is then called by the Spirit. You're sure he's pretty comfortable in uh, Samaria. He's moved out of Jerusalem. He's found a place where actually he's got a ministry. And God plicks him out and he just says, go. Go to the desert road between Jerusalem and Gaza. I don't know if any of you have ever been to a desert. It's not a place I would advise anybody to go to. I'm a northerner. I love the cold. I love just being able to walk around in three degrees in shorts and t-shirt. Um... The desert is not a place that I like to go to. It is too hot. It's too sweaty. The only benefit of going to the desert for me is that there's nobody around. I'm not really a people's person. Uh, I, I, I just can't, can't hack it. Every now and again, I've just got to close my door and just be like, I'm done with people. I'm done with them. But this wasn't Philip. Philip was a person who loved to be around people, who loved to share the gospel, who loved to share the good news. And God calls him from a place where he's in the center of it all and puts him in the place which would have been most uncomfortable for him because there's nobody around. This man who later is referred to as Philip the Evangelist has nobody to evangelize to. He gets stuck on the desert road. And then he comes across a chariot of a very strange man, a very weird little man. A eunuch from Ethiopia. This Ethiopian eunuch, we're told, is very powerful. He has a lot of authority. He has a lot of wealth. He has his own version of the book of Isaiah. That wasn't something that was, was, was regular. I think there's a stat which says that on average, uh, everybody in the UK has something like three Bibles. 
Uh, that's the average. I probably have about 17 of those by myself. So it's not evenly distributed. And my wife's just giving me a glare thing. No, it's about 115. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of Bibles. So those three aren't evenly distributed. But on average, everybody in the UK has around about three Bibles that they have access to. That wasn't something in the, uh, uh, around about the, the, the early uh, church that was accessible. You had to be rich because every single book of the Bible had to be handwritten, hand copied from an original by a certified rabbinical law uh, uh, expert who had to hand copy it and make sure every dot was in the right place and every line was in the right place and all this kind of stuff. And so to get your hands on a copy of a book of the Bible back in those times was extremely rare. It wasn't something you easily came across. And you had to have wealth, even to get one for your community, let alone to have a personal copy. This guy, the eunuch, probably was traveling with an entourage. It probably wasn't just him. We only hear about him. But actually, he was of such high importance that he would have been traveling with an entire entourage. The journey from Ethiopia up to Jerusalem was around about three and a half weeks. That's only one way. It's three and a half weeks the other way. And we learned that the eunuch traveled from Ethiopia and was on his way back home. There's one thing you've got to remember about eunuchs is that in the Jewish law, they weren't allowed to worship in the temple. So this guy had traveled all the way from Ethiopia to the temple for three and a half weeks in order to meet with God, in order to bring his sacrifices to the temple, because this is the place where the presence of God resided on earth. And he was turned away from the door. Three and a half weeks traveling, probably being quite comfortable. He wasn't, he wasn't traveling economy. You know, whenever I fly, I fly the cheapest. It's generally Ryanair where you have to pay extra for toilet facilities and all that kind of stuff. This, this guy was flying first class, premium. He had his own kind of servants to come with him and everything. He wanted for nothing, so it, don't, don't feel too bad for him. But, uh, but three and a half weeks travel to come and meet with God, and you're turned away at the door. We just can't imagine that. Growing up in the Christian church, we can't imagine that. Because actually, I know that God's presence is accessible for me here and now. If I had to travel for three and a half weeks to do anything, I, I don't think I'd do it. We live in a world of instantaneous access, where everything is given to us at a moment's notice. I can get something ordered to my front door next day. I don't know if I could get the presence of God ordered, but Amazon would have a pretty good go at it. But this man had traveled for three and a half weeks to be turned away at the door. And on his way home, God decides that he's going to meet with him anyways. Forget about the religious nonsense. Forget about the rules and regulations and these things cutting this person out from here and here and here. God had an appointment with the eunuch, a divine appointment which had been laid down before the foundations of the world. It's because of the appointment with the eunuch that actually the church in uh, Ethiopia started. Ethiopia, the church in Ethiopia, founds it, finds its foundation in this meeting with a treasurer from Ethiopia. God had a divine appointment that the, the temple may turn you away, but I accept you. I want to bring you in. And in, do, in order to do that, he sends this guy, Philip, to come alongside him. Takes Philip from the hustle and bustle and ministry that he probably loves to this desert place. And here, Philip meets with the eunuch. And there is a divine appointment that is made. Philip sees a charity. He sees his opportunity. And God says to him, go, that is the man that you have to, you know, you have to go and share with. That's who you've got to go alongside. 
I don't know about you, but I'm not very good at just stopping and listening to God. I, I am, I'm always up for the new ideas. I'm always up for the next thing. I'm always up for, for kind of trying something new. I struggle to be silent. I struggle to just stop and say, God, this is my idea. What's your idea? Yeah, Lord, I hear that. I, that, that. That'd be a great idea, Lord. But how about this? You know, yeah, Lord, that, that, that's a good idea. That, that's something that I'm sure will have great fruit. But what about this idea, Lord? This one's more exciting. Lord, I don't want to go and preach in the desert to one person. I want the stadium full. I want to do the Billy Graham thing. I want to stand in a stadium and I want to preach the gospel to 10,000 people at once. I don't want to do the one. But Philip listened. He heard what God was saying and he went to the one. And what we read is that Philip came alongside him. Do you know that the best way to evangelize and share the gospel is actually through relationships. There are some of us who are gifted more in evangelism than others. Some of us who it's natural for compared to others. But that doesn't mean that for those of us who aren't gifted in it, that we, don't, we, we get to just put it off. Oh, I don't have the gift of evangelism. It's not really my kind of thing. I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave Jimmy to do it. Jimmy's the evangelist. He can share the gospel with a random stranger at a bus stop. But I know, no, that's, that's not me. We have neighbors. We have friends. Many of us probably have family who have no idea of the truth of the gospel. The picture shared earlier on about the whirlpool. That's a very scary place to be in. It's a very scary place to find yourself in that place where you're just being swirled around. That's not just something for us here, but actually, you might have friends, you might have neighbors who find themselves in that place. And I can tell you that in the midst of that scariness, the only place to find true comfort is at the foot of the cross. There are so many places that we can go to these days in order to find support and help, but there is only one way to transform lives, and that's through the truth of the gospel. What we see is we see Philip come alongside the eunuch, and he starts where he's at. The eunuch was reading from the, the, the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, as we now know it. Uh, it didn't have numbers back then. But it's now chapter 53, uh, and he was reading verses 7 and 8. If you want to go and have a look at later on, you uh, probably, if you've read Isaiah, uh, Isaiah is a great book. Uh, lots of uh, Jesus kind of stuff going on in there. Uh, if you've ever read Isaiah, you'll have probably read Isaiah 53 at some point. Just go and read it, and let the truth of the gospel sink in. It is, it is the gospel in a nutshell. It's about Christ coming to earth. It's about Christ taking on our, frict- our afflictions, about taking on our burdens, about taking on our sins onto himself so that we can have freedom, we can have transformation. And so Philip comes alongside and he shares with the eunuch the truth of the gospel. If we want to do evangelism, let's just do it this way. We've got to do it with God's direction, God's guidance. It might not be to the person you expect. It might not be to the place you expect. But God is sharing with you right now the person that he wants you to share the good news of Jesus Christ with. There are so many opportunities in Luden to share the good news, to share the gospel. And God wants us to start to take them. So take some time, listen to God, reflect on it, let him show you where to begin. I promise you the first one he'll share you with, it'll be an easy one. He'll he'll not start you on the hard route. 
You know, if you listen to God and you say to God, God, who do you want me to share the gospel with this week? God will share you one name and he'll share you the easy one. That, that one. Start, start there. Start with where God takes you to. Not where you want to be. Where God wants you to be. Then we need to come alongside the person and start from where they're at. Later on in Acts, we read a story of Paul who preaches, uh, and uh, he preaches about the unknown God. There was a whole range of different gods, but there was a statue to the unknown God. And the statue to the unknown God was because everybody wanted to cover their bases. Yes, we want to pray to Zeus, and we want to pray to to Saturn, and, and all these different gods out there. We want to pray to Baal. But do you know what? There might be one that we don't know about. Just, just cover our bases so that we can't have any wrath of the gods. We'll, we'll go to the unknown God. And so Paul stands up and he says, I've noticed you've got a statue about the unknown God. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about the God that you do not know. He wants to know each one of you intimately. Start with where they're at and go on from there. And then we read that Philip takes the opportunity. He shares the good news. At some point, we have to share the good news. I don't know if you know the good news. I don't know when the last time it was that you heard the good news. But let me tell you it again, just so that you know. And if this is the first time that you've heard about this, and this is the first time that you've had an opportunity to respond to this, then today is your day where you get a chance, if you want to, to respond to the good news. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The world is crazy. It's full of so many things that that are going wrong. And that's because of sin in our world. That's because we as humans have a natural tendency to disobey the laws of God. And it doesn't matter in what ways we disobey. Some of us, it's, it's big things. Some of us, it's small things. Have you ever told a lie? I remember stealing a five-pound note from my mum as a child. It, it wasn't a massive sin. You know, it probably didn't bother my mum because she probably didn't miss the fiver. My backside hurt for a week when she found out. But we all do things wrong. This isn't about me being a good person. It's about me recognizing that without Christ, I cannot do good. I am a sinner. There is something in me that draws me to do the things that are against God. Pride and envy, jealousy, malice and anger. I only have to look at the news and politics for anger to raise up within me. It's great that you guys remember to pray for our leaders because it's not an easy job. But because of all of this sin that's going on around the world, the world is broken. And that brings separation between us and God. And God didn't want that separation. And so he chose. He chose up to give the glory of heaven up. He chose to give it all up and come as a baby. To take on flesh, to live life. And he lived the perfect life. The Bible says he was tempted in every way and yet was without sin. If you've ever been tempted, Jesus was tempted in exactly the same way. He was tempted to steal. He was tempted to tell lies. Fellas, he was tempted to look at another lady in a way he shouldn't have done. Jesus was tempted in every single way, and yet he was without sin. And because he was without sin, he was able to give up his life. As a sacrificial lamb, he went to the cross. He died for our sins. Took on the burden of our sins so that we can actually have life, and life in all its fullness. That doesn't mean that bad things don't happen. That doesn't mean that we don't have to face persecution or trials or tribulation. But what it means is that actually we get to be filled with his spirit. We get to have a joy that transcends all understanding. 
to live life and life in all its fullness and to serve God for the purposes and the ways that he has called us to serve him. That is the gospel. I don't know who God is calling you to share the gospel with this week. But I know there is somebody. I'll be praying as well as to who, the God, who God is sh- calling me to share the gospel with. The church has to be less comfortable. We have to be willing to get off our backsides and get out the doors and to share the good news with those who we come in contact with. Because actually, gospel changes lives. It's not just some fairy tale, not just some mythical little nonsense that we're messing around with. It changes lives. I know for me that actually I was a 14-year-old lad who had a lot of anger issues. I used to get in fights all the time. I used to, used to, I used to be pretty good at fights. Um, but actually, at the age of 14, God called me and he said, I want to do something different. I want you to be a man after my own heart. And instantly, overnight, my anger vanished. That doesn't mean I don't still get angry sometimes. But instantly, overnight, my life was transformed with the good news of the gospel that Jesus came to save me from my sin, to transform my life, and to use me in his service to serve and transform the world around me. So be praying about that person who God is calling you to. But maybe this, as I say, is the first time you've ever heard the gospel. And you want to respond to that. You want to respond to that good news. That God wants to save you. That he wants to transform your life. Maybe it's been a while since you've responded to the good news. And you want to respond again. You want to say, God, I lost touch with you but I want to I wanna touch in again. I want to go deeper again. I want you to transform my life. Be with me in that whirlpool. We're going to sing a song uh, now in response. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned and clean. Is that the question that you have today? I know sometimes I struggle with that. How could God love me? Later on, it says, he took my sin and my sorrow. He made them his very own. Jesus took your sin, took your sorrow upon himself so that you have no need to have any part of it. And finally, when with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. It shall be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. And I pray that that is your song. I pray that that is your prayer. That actually when we, when we stand with the ransomed in glory, that actually when we see Jesus face to face, we shall be able to sing of his glory throughout the ages. Let's sing this together. Let's reflect. Let's pray. If you want somebody to pray with you, I don't know how you do that in this church, but I'm sure that people would love to pray with you. I'm sure there are people around who would love to be able to share the gospel with you in order to, for you to receive the good news, in order for you to be sent out. I'm sure there are people who would love to pray with you in order to empower you to go out and share the good news with your friends, your neighbors, and your families this week. So as you respond, as you sing, Let this be your song for this week. May you stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene.